Meet Kibitan, a yellow bird-like mascot that Japanese officials are hoping will keep children safe from radiation poisoning in the disaster zones around the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Leaflets are being passed around Japan featuring Kibitan, who warns children about the dangers of radiation and tells them to stay away from pools and ditches of radioactive waste. Countless children in Japan are at risk of developing cancer as a result of the Fukushima meltdown last year. According to a recent study from Fukushima Medical University, 36% of the children in the area have overgrown thyroid glands, leaving them prone to cancer. Japan recently recognized the 20-month anniversary of the start of the Fukushima nuclear crisis, and today only one nuclear power plant is in operation in that country. And geologists are warning it's sitting on a fault line. Geologists at Tokyo's Toyo University are urging the Japanese government to halt operations at the Oi nuclear plant and to conduct research underground to see if it's in danger. Asked if the plant should remain open, one of the lead geologists said, it would be a very silly option. We would have learned nothing from Fukushima. I'm afraid we would see a repeat one day, end quote. Since the Fukushima crisis began, several thousand Japanese citizens have been rallying in the streets routinely against nuclear power, demanding that all the plants be shut down. And so the government has responded with Kibitan. So what's the latest on Fukushima and the rest of the nuclear problems coming out of Japan and the rest of the world for that matter? Kevin Camps joins me now. He's the radioactive waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear. Kevin, welcome back. Hi, Tom. Thank you. Great to have you. Thanks. Tell us about the Oi nuclear power plant. Well, like you said, it's the only nuclear power plant to be reactivated after March 11th, 2011. Two reactors have been fired up. That was in June of this year. So there was actually a month where there were no operating reactors in Japan. Mm -hmm. So four reactors were destroyed at Fukushima Daiichi in the catastrophe. But there are 50 operable reactors in the country. So two are operating and 48 remain, remain closed down. And the two in this oil plant are on a fault line? Well, Japan is riddled with fault lines, both on land and just off the coastline. And Harvey Wasserman, who's a longtime nuclear watchdog in the United States, I think it was 1997 I heard him speak, and he said, future generations will look back and see nuclear power plants as markers for earthquake fault lines, in <laughs> Japan especially so. But here in the United States, we have many nuclear reactors close to fault lines, on top of fault lines. And OE is unfortunately very likely on top of an active fault line. Yeah, well, that was my follow-up question. How many nuclear plants in the United States are facing the same situation? Is, do we have a count? Well, and many. I mean, out on the California coast, you've got Diablo Canyon with two reactors. You've got San Onofre with two reactors near the San Andreas Fault and major fault lines. And in fact, all the time, in recent years, there have been discoveries of new fault lines. So just off of Diablo Canyon, very close by, within a, a mile or a few miles, a new fault line was discovered called mm -hmm. the Shoreline Fault Line. And up at Indian Point, very close to New York City, within 25 miles of city limits, new fault lines were discovered. Ironically enough, Indian Point in New York is perhaps the most risky reactor. There's two reactors there in terms of seismic risks mm -hmm. because the plant wasn't built strongly enough to withstand them. It was just regarded as it's in the east, there are no seismic risks, it wasn't built well. And now there's fault lines right nearby. So it could crack the same way the Washington Monument did when we had a small earthquake here in D.C. Well, that very earthquake you mentioned, August of 2011, actually did damage to the uh, nuclear plant in Virginia, um, North Anna, with two wow. units. The radioactive waste storage especially was damaged down there. What's the latest on persistent radiation coming out of Japan, uh, particularly coming here to the United States? We, we, last time we talked, fish were starting to show up on the West Coast uh, with high levels of radioactive cesium in them and uh, our government was turning off their detectors and stopping their evaluations, as I recall. What's going on? Just in recent days, uh, headlines in Japan, the federal government of Japan cannot understand why the radiation levels are so high in certain species of fish that are still being caught off the coast of Japan. And it's something we talked about early on in the catastrophe. There's this phenomenon called biomagnification, bioconcentration. It's where the big fish eat the little fish, and the little fish have eaten the plankton the radioactivity concentrates up the food chain. We're at the top of the food chain. And again, the regulations in the U.S. are worse than the regulations in Japan in terms of radioactive contamination. So in Japan, they're keeping radioactive fish out of the food chain? They, they measure every fish? or They, they claim to be, but there's uh, problems. They're not catching everything for sure. We've yeah. seen that in Chernobyl as well. There are systems set up, but there are problems with the system. 
the difference between Japan and the United States is kind of startling. In Japan, at this point, the permissible level of radioactivity in food is 100 becquerels per kilogram. A becquerel is a radioactive disintegration per second. Right. So 100 becquerels per kilogram in Japan. In the United States, the permissible level is 1,200. So Whoa. Japan's limits are 12 times stronger than ours, which means that we could very uh, certainly be importing food from Japan that's considered unfit to eat there and be but The Japanese wouldn't sell to their own people. They'll sell it to us because our, our that's, that's insane. Um, Japan is deploying this yellow mascot, Kibitan, if I'm saying it right, uh, to warn kids about radiation. Uh, what is the situation, in, seriously, for kids around Fukushima and, and frankly, around the world? I mean, in the, even the U.S. West Coast, downwind of, uh, and downstream, I guess, uh, ocean currents of this thing. Children are very vulnerable to radioactivity, much more so than adult white males, which is the standard reference man in the United States for radiation protections. Mm. Women are more, more vulnerable than men. Pregnant women and the fetus are the most vulnerable of all. So unfortunately, the standards have been established for a 25-year-old white male who weighs 160 pounds. This dates back to the 1940s, 1950s. Yeah. So they're very vulnerable, uh, heartbreaking stories in Fukushima. Parents will not let their children play outside because they're concerned about the radioactive contamination. Families have been thrown onto their own resources to check the school lunches. Uh, unfortunately, children are living in fear of radiation, and it's everyday life for large numbers of children. One of the very startling uh, headlines in recent weeks has been that a third of the children in Fukushima Prefecture have nodules and cysts on their thyroids. Mm. This could be a precursor for thyroid pathology, thyroid cancer, a disease unheard of in children uh, apart from exposure to things like radioactive iodine-131. Right. We saw that at Chernobyl, epidemic numbers of childhood thyroid pathology incidents that continue uh, to this day, uh, children were exposed in utero as young children, and the damage done to their thyroid will persist. And those were early warning signs uh, of further things like, you know, cesium heart and some of these other positions. Right, Chernobyl yeah. heart. Uh, yeah, Chernobyl heart. We, got, we yeah. have to wrap it up. But Kevin, thank you so much for being with us and for the thank great work that you're doing.